third Sunday of Advent. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners. Normally around Christmas time we think a lot about gifts or what we might receive or what we might give. But there, what we need to understand in, in this time of Advent is that there's a movement that God makes that the human mind doesn't fully grasp. And so when we suffer, He draws closer. And when we need Him more, that's when He's nearest to us. But typically human beings think that when we're suffering, God is far from us. Or that when things are going well, we don't need God. But the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus came because we were brokenhearted, we were captives, and we needed to be set free. The fact that happens at Christmas is that Jesus comes to us and there's no way that we could keep Him away. I will live here in, um, in Mexico and I work at a Casa Hogar for troubled and abandoned youth. And one time, a young boy ran away and we actually found him with the cows. We found him in a pesebre, in a feeding trough. And he was there not wondering what gift he would get for Christmas or what party he would go to. He was wondering if somebody would come to him and to help him to be set free, that somebody would love him and come all the way close to him and find him. And that's the message of Jesus Christ at Christmas. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Those whose spirit is crushed, he will save. And so this young man was waiting for someone to come to him. And the message at Christmas time is that Jesus couldn't be stopped. He wanted to come to us and to help us. And so during this time of Advent, we need to see ourselves as the captives, as the brokenhearted. And if we open our hearts to him, we can be set free. And then we'll find true joy in Christmas. Hello, I'm Jeff Cavins, and today we're looking at the readings for the third Sunday in Advent. We're still in that preparation mode. We're still awaiting the coming of the King and preparing ourselves for that. And the readings reflect it once again this week. We're reading from John's Gospel this week, John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and then 19 through 28. And in the readings here, matched with the first reading in Isaiah chapter 61, we realize something about the way the church puts the readings together to tell us something that is actually very, very encouraging. And maybe you need encouragement in your life. What have you been going through this last year? Have you been discouraged? Have you been let down? Maybe you've become very disappointed in people at work or family or extended family. The readings this week point to a new beginning. They point to a new opportunity. Something is about to take place that is going to change everything. Maybe you've gone through a season of your life where you felt you have been captive. Maybe you have been all tied up in, in legalities or in relationships that just seem to go nowhere, and you want that new beginning. Well, John speaks in chapter 1. It says in verses 6 through 8, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. And then we skip a number of verses and we go all the way to verse 19 of John chapter 1. And it says, And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? I bet they were wondering, huh? Who are you? And he confessed, he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? Because there was some discussion that he might be Elijah. He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? The prophet, which was mentioned back in Deuteronomy, and Moses mentioned that one will come, a prophet like myself. He answered, no. And they said to him, then who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said this. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? And John answered them, 
I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know, even he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. This took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now here's what's interesting is that in the reading this week, John is admitting, I am not the Christ, but I am one who is sent before him to make the path straight. He is the forerunner. Micah talks about the forerunner and the prophet Micah. But there's another place where this is quoted from that is very important, and that is the book of Isaiah. In fact, John chapter 1, which we just read, is coupled with, in this, re with this week's readings, with Isaiah chapter 61. In Isaiah chapter 61, it talks about how the Lord will bring freedom and deliverance. That freedom and deliverance that Isaiah is speaking about is in a section of Isaiah that speaks of consolation. Isaiah is divided up into a number of parts, and in this latter part, we're talking about a consolation that is going to take place in Israel. And that is what John is focusing on here, is that there's a new beginning, and there has been a rough time, and God is bringing consolation to his people. Now, that's what John is telling us about the kingdom of God, and it speaks about a jubilee. It speaks about a jubilee, and that's what Isaiah is talking about in Isaiah 61. Now, a jubilee is a time of every 50 years in Israel's history. They have a jubilee where they, they release captives, slaves. They forgive debt. They give property back. It is a new beginning. And so part of our Advent preparation is one of ourselves experiencing and awaiting a jubilee of freedom from Jesus, a freedom that he's going to offer us, he's going to make available in our life. It's a beautiful thing. So I want to encourage you this week, if you're going through a difficult time, if you have, you've been going through a period of your life that is very dark and very cold and it's silent, Prepare yourself for the coming of the king because he will make all things new in your life. That's not just a message. That's a message of hope. That is a message we all need to hear. Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 2 and 10 to 11. Rejoice in the Lord heartily. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to announce a year of favor from the Lord, and a day of vindication by our God. I rejoice heartily in the Lord. In my God is the joy of my soul. For he has clothed me with a robe of salvation, and wrapped me in a mantle of justice, like a bridegroom adorned with a diadem, like a bride bedecked with her jewels. As the earth brings forth its plants, and a garden makes its growth spring up, so will the Lord God make justice and praise spring up before all the nations. The Word of the Lord. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 4 we hear that Jesus had returned to Nazareth, the village in which he lived in as a youth, and an adult. He, like any other faithful Jews regularly attended the synagogue services on Saturday, the Sabbath. There he was asked to deliver an interpretative homily on the weekly scripture reading from Isaiah 61. Jesus finishes his homily with, Today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. In effect he is saying I am the Messiah the Savior of the world. Luke 4 verse 28 When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were all filled with fury. Then the people wanted to kill him because they felt he had committed blasphemy. The congregants of the synagogue believed that Jesus had falsely misrepresented himself as the Son of God. The imagery of the bridegroom and bride are also important. Jesus is the bridegroom, and his bride, is the church. Ephesians 5 verses 25 and 26, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word. Christ was clothed with the robe of salvation, we too, 
can be clothed in that same robe by attempting to live the Christian life, following the Ten Commandments, and the Beatitudes for the rest of our time on earth. Rejoice in the Lord! My soul rejoices in my God. My soul rejoices in my God. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked down upon his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. My soul rejoices in my God. The Almighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. My soul rejoices in my God. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy. My soul rejoices in my God. Psalm Luke chapter 1 verses 46 to 48, 49 to 50, and 53 to 54. My soul rejoices in God my Savior. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked upon his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel for he has remembered his promise of mercy. This reading takes place when the Blessed Virgin Mary visits Elizabeth in her home located in the hill country of Judea. You will recall this is the same area the Ark of the Covenant stayed for three months before King David brought it to Jerusalem. Today's reading is sometimes called the Magnificat which comes from Mary's first word to Elizabeth in the Latin translation. We see many of the same words used in the Magnificat as those used by Hannah in her prayer for her son Samuel. Both women Hannah and Mary are announcing their faith in God to control every aspect of their lives. Both women are certain that they are part of God's plan. Hannah also speaks of God as her rock, firm and unchanging. Our earthly lives are constantly changing, people move in and out of our lives, children grow, and leave to start their own families. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Hannah, Anne, Elizabeth, and Mary all recognize that God is our unchanging foundation, the rock, the foundation of our faith. All of these women were misjudged by those around them. Eli the high priest thought Hannah to be a drunk. Elkanah, Hannah's husband, from the priestly tribe of Levi, judged her to be barren, unable to give birth, so he married another woman in his effort to have offspring and heirs to his wealth, polygamy was a common practice of the time. Hannah was heartbroken, but accepted her lot in life, but knew Elkanah all loved her the most and would never cast her aside. Elizabeth's husband Zechariah, who was also from the priestly tribe of Levi had also judged her to be barren. It is also interesting to note that all three women recognized that the only one who was truly in charge was God. The men thought, as was common in their culture, that they were in charge, both had forgotten that the only one in charge is God. Joseph had also judged his betrothed, Mary, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to send her away quietly. Why quietly? 
because if she had been found with child and not married, she would have been stoned to death. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and told him to wed, Mary, because she had conceived by the Holy Spirit. Elkanah, Hannah, Zechariah, and Elizabeth came from the same hill country north of Jerusalem. This is the same area that the Ark of the Covenant was stored for three months before being returned to Jerusalem. Mary, the new Ark, the new God Carrier, also stayed with Elizabeth three months in the same hill country. Later Mary and Joseph would return to the city of David, Bethlehem, the house of bread, so named because it was the place of David's birth, and it was there that Jesus, the bread of life, a descendant of the house of David, was also born. Catholics do not worship Mary. Here the Bible records Mary's prophetic words that say all generations will call me blessed. Catholics are only doing what the Bible says by giving her the honor, the title, she deserves when she is referred to as the Blessed Virgin Mary. God had only given one woman in all of history, the honor, the blessing, of giving birth to his son while remaining a virgin, thus we call her the Blessed Virgin Mary. We are freed from our original sin at baptism, while Mary was preserved from original sin at her conception. Mary was the fulfillment of Isaiah 7 verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The grace which was revealed in our world is Jesus. He has entered our history. He has shared our journey. He came to free us from darkness, and to grant us light. In him was revealed the grace, the mercy, and the tender love of the Father. Pope Francis First Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 16 through 24. May you entirely, spirit, soul, and body, be preserved blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in all circumstances give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Test everything, retain what is good. Refrain from every kind of evil. May the God of peace make you perfectly holy, and may you entirely, spirit, soul, and body, be preserved blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will also accomplish it. The Word of the Lord. God wants all of his people to be happy, in the same way every parent wants their children to be happy. As we approach Christmas we try to buy our children safe gifts that will bring them happiness. We know that in a couple of months, even weeks, or maybe by the end of the day, the gifts that we gave on Christmas morning will not bring them continued happiness because, in time, they will be accepted as commonplace. Just think of how you treat the many gifts of grace you have received from God. Are we any different than our children? We grow to accept the blessings, the God-given gifts of grace, as expected which causes us to lose our appreciation for them. If you are feeling a little rushed or depressed this Christmas season, remember God gave you both life and purpose. Are you the mirror who will reflect God's love? Or will you be the rushed shopper, impatient with those around you? Will you forget to thank the sales clerk for their help? Hardly the mirror which reflects God's love is it. As you sit on the freeway becoming upset with drivers who won't get out of your way, consider that your time would be well spent praying, speaking with God about your life, maybe saying a rosary rather than being anxious about traffic. Those are only a couple of ways your Christian life becomes God's mirror of love. That's what St. Paul is saying, rejoice always, we are Christians a people of hope, that rests in the sure and certain knowledge that the Lord will not abandon us or leave us orphans. Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I shall say it again, rejoice. Your kindness should be known to all. The Lord is near. Have no anxiety at all, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. 
then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. John was sent from God. He came for testimony, to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? He admitted and did not deny it, but admitted, I am not the Christ. So they asked him, What are you then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? So we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you have to say for yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Some Pharisees were also sent. They asked him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but there is one among you whom you do not recognize, the one who is coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. This happened in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I want to uh, welcome our Knights of Columbus here, here for co Corporate Communion. Uh, that's why you, they came in. Uh, I think they're making a presentation later on. Uh, we're glad to have them here. Uh, <laughs> Ma'am, could I have you stand up just a second, please? Sure. This woman is wearing pink. <laughs> I am wearing rose. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. I have to straighten this out. Every, every, twice a year I have to do this to you people because I invariably get, oh, Father, you look pretty in pink. So Today uh, we celebrate Gaudete Sunday, which is a, the joyful Sunday of Advent. But it also, if you notice, every one of the passages of Scripture emphasize that understanding of God being present to us, God's love, not only to us in, in the, this modern world, to 21st century, but throughout history. We heard the first reading from Isaiah. After these people have been, uh, have been slaves in Babylon, for, have been there for a hundred, almost a hundred years, all of a sudden Isaiah is turning around and saying to them, a year of favor. God is blessing us amidst all the difficulties of life. About, about what, where our chance to come back home is, is upon us. God is, is present to us. He has not for, forgotten us. 
His forgiveness is present. That's what we are joyful about. I don't know if any of you have seen the news this past week, but let's face it. This week in the news, two young soldiers are coming back from from the Middle East as casualties from Central Florida. There are the economy still in the tube, down the tubes. Unemployment still inching up. Our politicians don't know what they're doing, and that's not a political statement. <laughs> they don't know. They're, they're fighting among themselves. The world is up, up, up in arms over everything. What do we have to be happy and joyful about? Well, the message is very clear today. Because if you think this is bad, you should be those people that Isaiah is talking about. Then you really know what bad is. So he's turning to, uh, to them and to us and telling us, God is still with us. God's blessings are with us. And we know that even more than ever because we have Jesus Christ. Now, if you'd heard the, did you catch the psalm today, the responsorial psalm, the, the responsorial psalm usually comes from the book of Psalms. Where did it come from today? It was the Magnificat, which comes from the gospel. We had two gospels today. And supposedly the priest was the only one that's supposed to say the gospel. But anyway... The, the, the emphasis is we see here the story, the, the prayer of Mary. And she is, let's face it, this is that prayer that she makes right after she finds out that, guess what? I'm not married and I'm pregnant. You think you've got it bad. In Jesus' time when someone, a young girl was, was found pregnant and should not marry, she was shunned. She was pushed out. What she was facing was tremendous. And what does she have to say? The Lord has blessed me. In those words alone, in that situation alone, she sees the Lord's presence. Her eyes are open. She expresses the greatest joy that ever one could imagine. That's the message of today. God's joy is among us. His presence is here. We heard that in the second reading to Paul to the Thessalonians. He proceeds to tell us, you must be joyful. You as Christians must be joyful at all times because you know, you know that God's presence is with us. So we, you know, we get caught up in all this, the commotion of the world and things around us and we seem to forget at times what God has in store for us. This gospel, we had the, the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of jo St. John. And of course, St. John is written differently, and more poetic. And, and so what does he start with? There's not a word saying about anything about Jesus in that, in that beginning of the passage of Scripture. All it tells us, he says, a voice crying out in the winter, wilderness. John, the baptizer, appears in the desert, proclaiming, proclaiming the good news that the Messiah is coming. He is not the one, it proclaims. Why were people going out to him? I always picture John the baptizer as, you know, a, some sort of seedy-looking character. I mean, let's face it, he was camel's hair and, and ate locusts and honey. I mean, that's not my idea of gourmet cuisine. I, I, the idea that he, 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 people were coming to him listening to what he said, they flocked to him. They said the priests and, the, and the, uh, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were all coming out to say, what does he have to say? And his response is, I'm not he. I'm not a prophet. I'm not Elijah. Well, then who are you? Why are we out here? And why did they come out? Well, you know, in Jesus' time, you were what your father was. So what we have here is that John the baptizer's father was a priest. So he had all the rights and privileges of proclaiming God. 
And so he had something to say, and that's why they flocked out to him. So what is he, what is he saying? Is God has blessed this, this household, so where, where is he coming from? Are you the uh, Messiah? No. Who are you then? I'm a voice crying out into the wilderness. wilderness. I am the one telling you, prepare yourselves. The Messiah is on the way. There's a sense of joy and excitement in John the baptizer. He is thrilled that he is the messenger. I mean, which one of us would turn around and say, yes, guess what? I'm not the one. I'm not the, I'm not the one responsible. I'm, not, I'm just the messenger. You know, we always have that little statement that people say, don't kill the mess- messenger. The message is always that, you know, well, I, I'm not going not gonna to be worried about this. But the messenger is, great, is filled with great glee, excitement. To proclaim, and then he even says, he says he puts himself in a humble situation, and he says, "I'm not even, I'm not even capable or privileged to to tie the sandals of his on his sandals, the straps on his sandals." He proceeds to say how I'm so humbled before God, and I'm humbled in the sense that I'm filled with the joy of God because I see God at work. Every one of these passages of Scripture emphasize that excitement of God's presence in our lives. God never has given up on us. We know that. John the baptizer tells us that he he baptizes us with water. Those people. He baptizes them with water. Now in Jesus' time, around Jesus' time, there was baptism everywhere. It was a very common occurrence. And even the Jewish people, we had this, it was sort of a, more of a cleansing ritual. Even we hear Jesus tell us, tell the lepers and everything, go to the pool and, and wash, be baptized, wash yourself. The cleansing before you go to the temple or go to visit the priest. It was, it was a common occurrence. Baptism was, it was used as a ritual of, of cleansing one. Even today, you go to a mosque, a Muslim mosque, and what do the people do? Immediately, before they walk into the, in the mosque, they bathe, they wash their feet and their hands, their head, their forehead. They re- re- response of the idea of a baptism of cleansing. It prepares us to be in the presence of God. And that's what, what John is telling them. You not, must prepare yourself so that your eyes will be opened. We know throughout history, in this gospel, uh, John is turning to us and telling us, Paul knew it, Mary knows it, Isaiah knows it. They have their eyes open to God. We are called to be the same way. Our eyes are supposed to be open that we realize that God's love is, is with us. John tells us, I baptize you with water, He will come and baptize you with Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, will be made known to you. We see that, we hear those in the prayers, the Eucharistic prayers. The Holy Spirit, that we may be one with Christ, with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Nine-tenths of, I would say, most everyone here has been baptized with that Holy Spirit. We shouldn't be looking at the things around our world and saying, oh, life is just miserable. Life is. We as Christians, we stand up and say, we know what this celebration is about. God has touched his people. That's why we're preparing. We are preparing in the same way for his, as the celebration of, baptism, of, of, his, of his birth, of his coming to, in our presence. And we see that joy. There's no doubt that I'm in rows for this day. Because it is a celebration of God's presence in our lives. And every single one of us here should be filled with that joy. Because that's how we prepare for Christmas.
John chapter 1 verses 6 to 8, and 19 to 28. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, to bring glad tidings to the poor. A man named John was sent from God. He came for testimony, to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to him to ask him, Who are you? He admitted and did not deny it, but admitted, I am not the Christ. So they asked him, What are you then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? So we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you have to say for yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the desert, Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Some Pharisees were also sent. They asked him, Why then do you baptize, if you are not the Christ, or Elijah, or the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but there is one among you whom you do not recognize, the one who is coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. This happened in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord You might ask yourself why the priests and Levites thought that John the Baptist was Elijah. In the Old Testament book of Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 we read, Behold, I send my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek. In Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 this messenger is called Elijah. In Matthew chapter 11 verse 10, these words are quoted by Christ as referring to John the Baptist, who prepared the way for the coming of the Savior. The Baptist even dressed like Elijah. Are you the prophet? They thought that John might have been the prophet spoken of in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brethren him you shall heed. John the Baptist was sent just as Jesus was sent, with a divine mission. John was a member of the priestly tribe of Levi whose function was to serve the people. The priests we have today exercise that same function, to speak the word of God, and to minister to the people. When you examine John the Baptist's life you can see his humility. It would have been easy for him to claim that he was someone he wasn't, but he remained humble. John viewed himself as a slave not someone of importance when he said. John chapter 1 verse 27, Even he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Untying sandals was the job of a slave, certainly not a person of importance. As Leonardo da Vinci showed in his painting of John, he was always pointing others to God. This is a homily for the third Sunday of Advent. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. John chapter 1, verses 6 to 8 and verses 19 to 28. The first reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, and verses 10 and 11. The third Sunday of Advent is known as Gaudete Sunday. Gaudete is the Latin word for rejoice. So amidst the more somber mood of Advent, Gaudete Sunday bids us rejoice because the celebration of Christmas is close at hand. So today we make our own the words of St. Paul to the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, Rejoice, the Lord is near. And on this Sunday we light the rose-coloured candle of the Advent wreath, another symbol of joy. And this is one of only two Sundays of the year when the priest may wear a rose-coloured chasuble. The other Sunday is Leitare Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Lent. 
and here you can see Pope Francis wearing a rose-coloured chasuble. We are now in year B of the Church's liturgical cycle, the year of St. Mark. That means that on most Sundays of this year, the Gospel we read comes from the Gospel of St. Mark. But from time to time we'll have guest appearances from the Gospel of St. John, as we do this Sunday. Today's Gospel introduces us to John the Baptist who comes as a witness to speak for the light. We're told that the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask John a number of questions. The questions they put to John remind me of a verse from T.S. Eliot's play, The Rock. O my soul, be prepared for the coming of the stranger. Be prepared for him who knows how to ask questions. Sometimes I think that the scriptures are just as important for the questions they pose than for the answers they give. And the Gospels pose quite a number of questions. If you were to carefully count all the questions that are asked in each of the four Gospels, you'd find that there are more than 200 questions. And some of those questions should make us feel quite uncomfortable. They should disturb us. I recently read a magazine article entitled 10 Uncomfortable Questions. Do you want the good news or the bad news first? That was the first of the 10 uncomfortable questions. Number two was, will you promise not to get mad if I tell you something? Number three, you don't honestly expect me to believe that, do you? Number four, have you got any proof? Number five, you don't remember me, do you? Number six, now what's the matter? Number seven, have you been waiting long? Number eight, don't you have a sense of humour? Number nine, are you asleep? And number ten, do you think I've put on weight? Well, priests and Levites from Jerusalem are sent to ask John the Baptist what some would consider to be some very uncomfortable questions. Who are you? What have you to say about yourself? Why are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, and you're not Elijah, and you're not the prophet that Moses had promised? In other words, why are you doing what you're doing? Now, all of this is happening, by the way, at Bethany on the far side of the Jordan. This is the site that an ancient Christian tradition identifies as the place where John baptised. The wooden structure at the top protects the archaeological remains of an ancient Christian church built on the site. In the 6th century, a pilgrim by the name of Theodosius visited the site and wrote this account of his visit. At the place where my Lord was baptised is the Church of St. John the Baptist, which was constructed by the Emperor Anastasius. It stands on great vaults, which are high enough for when the Jordan is in flood. Anastasius was Emperor in Constantinople from 491 to 518 AD. So this is Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was asked these questions. And they're questions we could ask ourselves. Who am I? And I'm sure that we would answer that question differently at different stages of our life. Many people define themselves by what they do. I am what I do. My job defines me. I'm a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, a chef, a student, an accountant, a priest. And other people often define us by what we do. Isn't it interesting that the question, so what do you do, 
surfaces fairly soon in a conversation with someone we've just met. If you define yourself by what you do, by your occupation, that'll be satisfying if you're in a job that's fulfilling, if you're successful. But what happens when you retire, or if you're made redundant, or if you have a job which is considered fairly ordinary? Another way in which some people define themselves is by what other people say about them. I am what people say about me. Now, I guess that'd be satisfying if other people are saying complimentary things about you. But what if others speak badly about you, or maybe even worse still, they simply ignore you? And, of course, we have the temptation to define ourselves by what we have. Which means, of course, that if you have little or nothing, you're a nobody. So if we define ourselves by what we do, or by what others say about us, or by what we have, our lives will be a perpetual roller coaster. I'll be on a high when I'm wealthy, when people are saying great things about me, when I have a prestigious job. But I'll be down in the dumps if I earn very little of value, if people ignore me, or if I'm unemployed. John's Gospel answers the question, Who am I? for John the Baptist, very simply. He is a witness, a witness to speak for the light. He was not the light himself. The theme of light and darkness is prominent in John's Gospel. In the prologue of John's Gospel, the word made flesh is described as the true light that enlightens all people. A light that shines in the dark. A light that darkness could not overpower. But in chapter 3 we're told that although the light has come into the world, people have shown that they prefer darkness to the light. Consider this contemporary parable called the black hole. A young man is busy at the photocopier, and he's more than a little surprised when an A3 sheet of paper emerges from the printer with a large black circle. That certainly wasn't what he was photocopying. So he puts the page with the black circle to one side and goes on with his photocopying, but something strange happens. Now this gives him a bright idea. This black circle, now a black hole, could become very useful indeed. Now a bar of chocolate is one thing, but let's see what's in the room that contains the company safe. But who can be satisfied with that when there's more in the safe waiting to be taken?
devoured by the darkness. Though the light has come into the world, people have shown that they prefer darkness to the light. How would Jesus answer these questions that were put to John the Baptist? Who are you? What have you to say about yourself? And why are you doing what you're doing? Well, Jesus answered these questions by making today's first reading from the prophet Isaiah his own. Let me explain. The Gospels tell us that when Jesus began his public ministry, he left his hometown of Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum. Now, the distance between Capernaum and Nazareth is about 40 kilometres, maybe a two days walk. Today, it's a drive of just over an hour. On a return visit to Nazareth, Jesus goes into the local synagogue on a Sabbath day. And here you can see what a local tradition tells us is the site of the ancient synagogue of Nazareth. Jesus stands up to read and they hand him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolls it to the place which we now know is chapter 61. Although the Bible wouldn't have been divided into chapters and verses at that time. Jesus begins to read the very same reading that we heard at Mass today. The Spirit of the Lord has been given to me, for he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives and to the blind, new sight, to set the downtrodden free, to proclaim the Lord's year of favour. He then rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the assistant, and with all eyes in the synagogue fixed on him, he made a startling claim. This text is being fulfilled today, even while you are listening. In other words, this text finds its ultimate fulfillment in me and in what God has anointed me to do. Now, Isaiah had written these words over 500 years earlier, and they were addressed to the Jewish exiles in Babylon. They were words of encouragement and hope. Their exile would soon be over. But Jesus read the scriptures in the same way that we should all read the scriptures. We're not reading the scriptures because we're students of ancient history interested in what happened two and a half thousand years ago. We read the scriptures because we believe that the word of God is addressed to us here and now. Now Jesus would be the first to admit that the passage from Isaiah that he just read was in its original context a word of consolation to the exiles in Babylon 500 years earlier. But God's word transcends the context of time and place. Jesus hears these words as a commission from God right here and right now. God has anointed him. He is the Messiah, the Christ. God has sent him to proclaim liberty, to lead a rescue mission. He is the one who will give the blind new sight. He is the light of the world, leading us from darkness into light. Who are you? These words of Isaiah, says Jesus, tell you who I am. And they are being fulfilled right now, even as you listen. Who's your daddy? There is a lot of importance in knowing who you are and where you came from. Today we hear the people from Jerusalem asking John the Baptist that very question. Who are you? They are looking for some type of criteria with which to judge him. Unfortunately, we often judge people by their backgrounds or family history rather than by who they are. One morning, a professor and his wife were eating breakfast at a little restaurant, 
hoping to enjoy a quiet, family meal. While they were waiting for their food, they noticed a distinguished-looking, white-haired man moving from table to table, visiting with the guests. The professor leaned over and whispered to his wife, I hope he doesn't come over here. But sure enough, the man did come to their table. Where are you folks from? he asked in a friendly voice. Oklahoma, they answered. Great to have you here in Tennessee, the stranger said. What do you do for a living? I teach at a seminary, he said. Oh, so you teach preachers how to preach, do you? Well, I've got a really great story for you. With that, the gentleman pulled up a chair and sat down at the table with the couple. The professor groaned and thought to himself, Great just what I need, another preacher story. The man started, See that mountain over there. Pointing out the restaurant window. Not far from the base of that mountain, there was a boy born to an unwed mother. He had a hard time growing up, because every place he went, he was always asked the same question, Hey boy, who's your daddy? Whether he was at school, in the grocery store or drug store, people would ask the same question, Who's your daddy? He would hide at recess and lunchtime from the other students. He would avoid going into stores because that question hurt him so much. When he was about 12 years old, a new preacher came to his church. The boy would always go into the service late and slip out early to avoid hearing the question, Who's your daddy? But one day, the new preacher said the benediction so fast that he got caught and had to walk out with the crowd. Just about the time he got to the back door, the new preacher, not knowing anything about him, put his hand on his shoulders and asked him, Who's your daddy? The whole church got deathly quiet. He could feel every eye in the church looking at him. Now everyone would finally know the answer to the question, Who's your daddy? This new preacher, though, sensed the situation around him and using discernment only the Holy Spirit could give, said the following to That scared little boy. Wait a minute. I know who you are. I see the family resemblance now. You are a child of God. With that he patted the boy on his shoulder and said, Boy, you've got a great inheritance. Go and claim it. With that, the boy smiled for the first time in a long time and walked out the door a changed person. He was never the same again. Whenever anybody asked him, Who's your daddy? He'd just tell them, I'm a child of God. The distinguished gentleman got up from the table and said, Isn't that a great story? The professor responded that it really was a great story. As the man turned to leave, he said, You know, if that new preacher hadn't told me that I was one of God's children, I probably never would have amounted to anything. And he walked away. The seminary professor and his wife were stunned. He called the waitress over and asked her, Do you know who that man was? the one who just left that was sitting at our table. The waitress grinned and said, Of course. Everybody here knows him. That's Ben Hooper. He's the former governor of Tennessee. Maybe you or someone in your life needs a reminder that we are all God's children, and he has a special plan for each one of us. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 Stop judging, that you may not be judged.